Please welcome to the stage, Kim Pinkerton. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Pinkerton, and I'm a longtime NCTE member and the current Executive Secretary of the Texas Council of Teachers of English Language Arts, and it's my pleasure today to introduce to you NCTE President Jocelyn Chadwick. Maybe you know Dr. Chadwick, the Mark Twain scholar and author of over 40 publications, including The Gem Dilemma, Teaching Literature in the Context of Literacy Instruction, and the forthcoming Writing for Life, Using Literature to Teach Writing Literacy. Maybe you know Dr. Chadwick, the Harvard professor, an advocate who has been interviewed and honored almost over 30 different times. Maybe you know Dr. Chadwick, the NCTE leader, champion for classrooms, teachers, who for over set, has participated in over 70 presentation and panel experiences. Maybe you know Dr. Chadwick, the former high school teacher who now has over 40 years of experience in our field. Wow, her vita is intimidatingly impressive. Maybe she even seems a bit untouchable or unapproachable to you, but here is what I know. I know that Jocelyn loves working with and listening to teachers and students and that she continuously travels to schools to engage with those teachers and those students. I know that Jocelyn loves supporting NCTE affiliates like TCTELA, and that she attends their annual conferences and invites their members to be a part of a larger, the larger work of NCTE. I know that Jocelyn adores her sweet Giovanni and that in the evenings when things are finally quiet, they share martinis and sometimes some whiskey and ponder teaching and people and life. And I know that she has a very long contact list in her cell phone and that she likes to text and use emojis with abandon. I know that she makes her own cards and mails them through email and even the old fashioned way, even when maybe she needs to have some of us mail a card to her. I know that she puts others before herself, and I know all of this because just two short years ago, when I was essentially a stranger to Jocelyn, she took me under her wing because I was in need. She loved me when I could not buoy myself, she sent me those cards and texted me emojis and all and offered me help and opportunities that I could not have ever imagined. Jocelyn is one of the most fascinating, kind, intelligent, and compassionate people I've ever met. It's my pleasure to call her my friend and to introduce to you your NCTE president, Jocelyn Chadwick. but at least I don't have humid hair. That's a big deal. How is everybody? Good. I'm really glad to be here. Um, Kim told you things that only a friend would know about me, so now you know things about me that I would not have told you myself. <laughs> so I have a message for you from myself and from some teachers. And the topic of today is teaching has not left us, it has simply moved on. The question is, are we ready to follow? And I'd like for you to hear from Hugh Davis first. And the librarian high school in Winton. Davis, and I am the entire English department and the librarian at C.S. Brown High School in Winton, North Carolina. We're a small school. We actually started out as a Rosenwald school and its latest incarnation, we're the STEM school for the county. We have 68 students and I have the pleasure of working with them every year. So they get to know me and I get to know them. And I'm not sure that truly my teaching has moved forward. I'm not always positive about that, but I know it has evolved over the years. And one of the things is that I've been able to work with students and find ways, or at least ways I hope, that uh, make text relevant to them. 
And uh, when I teach critical thinking, research, analytical writing, I am a traditionalist. I use canonical text, but the students help me find ways to make them relevant to them, and I try to find ways to make them contemporary. Uh, and so one of the main things is to try to, uh, if, if they don't follow my lead, I can follow theirs. Uh, my school is 95% minority. And so just this past week, I've been teaching the Odyssey and I look at my students' faces and it's a tradition for me to teach it. The upperclassmen will go, well, have you done this assignment yet? Because they know what I've done and what's coming for these uh, freshmen. Uh, and they'll go up and they'll ask things. Uh, and what I realize when I look at the faces of my students is Homer is alien to many of them. So I've been using scenes this year from uh, Susan Park Laurie's uh, Father Comes Home from the Wars, which uh, moves into new, moves the same themes into a new setting and has African-American faces who look a lot more like the students I'm teaching. And I've got students saying, I want to read that whole thing. Why are we just doing excerpts from that? And I know when they have that excitement that something's working. But yep. last year they said, well, let's read Frankenstein. They said, this is a need to read text. They wanted to read it. And I said, all right, well, we don't have enough copies. We're poor and rural and what are we gonna do? Well, they contacted two other high schools and they worked out how to get a class set borrowed. And the students said, we're gonna do this. And so we did it. And uh, what I find is as they lead, I can follow. Uh, I think part of it is because I drill certain things such as the fact that I think they need to have cultural uh, literacy as we go, but they want to have that. And I think the key is making it real to them. And that's what I try to do is just to remind them that they can be the captains of their own ships. And that this. You'll find that throughout my talk, I work with teachers all the time. So anytime I go out these days, I'm, I'm either packing students and teachers or students or teachers. So today I'm packing teachers. So that was Hugh Davis. I think the man in the story represents a demigod. There really is no American dream. You know that, right? I have never read a whole book before. So what just makes up a genius? What do we want? We want you, our English teachers, to please protect us, make us feel safe, set the boundaries in your classrooms. So just why is literacy so important to me? What will it do? I wake up at four so I can catch my bus at five. My head is on my desk because I have a cyst under my tongue, but I wanted to come to school. These are but a few of the thousands of comments, perspectives, concerns students have shared with me and their mates since 2012. The conversation has most assuredly changed from when I was teaching at B118 at Irving High School and when I was teaching at the University of North Texas, and even when I began teaching at Harvard and continued my work with teachers and students around the country. The change is a generational one, yes, but keenly pivotal to this change began to transpire because of 9-11 and the Great Recession. Children emerging after these two events comprised what sociologists and psychologists identify as Generation Z forged with a seemingly instant fractured economy, uncertainty, challenges never before even imagined. Many of these students are amazingly resilient, voiced, insatiably curious, and risk takers. Tech savvy, these students represent our first global citizens, many of who have never left their homes, but have explored places, cultures, trends, movements, catastrophes through Twitter, Snapchat, blogs, apps, and other digital and virtual platforms. I think about these students constantly. I marvel and contemplate and study just how they and their predilections have affected us and our own perceptions and ideas of just what teaching English was, is, should be and will be. They are writing, reading, thinking. Constantly they tweet, Snapchat, Facebook, blog, Instagram. They're multimodal. They possess a unique lens through which they process not only how to make meaning for themselves, but also they use that lens to contextualize as they engage the texts we teach 
and set about to complete complementary tasks and projects we set. I composed this introduction focusing on students because of two friends. One friend, a teacher and writer, sent me the following note. Quote, I have given up teaching. Of course, maybe, teaching has given me up, with a question mark. And another dear friend wrote, quote, I have taught for 29 years. I feel that the value of my work has been negated. As I read these notes from two friends about whom I care much, I began thinking about the bigger picture. I asked myself if my two friends' feelings that teaching has left them and that their contributions to our profession are no longer valued really were indicative of what is happening to some of us, perhaps even to many of us in teaching English language arts. Or could the issue be that some of us are succumbing to the stereotype that teaching is no longer valued? English language arts is not valued as it once was. So in this address, I would like to share with you a message I hope I have conveyed in the past before this phase with NCTE, and a message I hope will continue to resonate long after that. And that message is, English language arts is not dead. English language arts sets the foundational building blocks for critical reading, critical thinking, critical writing, speaking, listening, and research. We in English language arts foment curiosity and inquiry, discovery and exploration, scaffolding and intersecting, extension and relevance. We in English language arts utilize all in our content arsenal, fiction, nonfiction, grammar and composition, cross-curricular and media. And for Generation Z, we have begun to add digital resources, art, music, film, and other forms of technology. I have found, for example, students are amazed at seeing the digitized version of the text that influenced Frederick Douglass, Caleb Bingham's The Columbian Orator. After seeing the actual digitized issues of 19th century black newspapers, such as The Elevator, The Colored American, and Douglass's Monthly, students not only want to read them, but also they seek to peer more deeply into the assigned text, as well as wanting to know more about the period and the people and the audience purpose and occasion that, su that supported these and many other newspapers and journals during the period. In a similar manner, these students find speeches, letters, interviews equally elucidating as they read assigned texts. Now we'll hear from Julia Torres. And the only way that students can really be um, have confidence that they're going to be sharing how in an authentic way is if we build structures and systems to help them have a voice, but also to help them participate in the learning experience in an authentic way. So it's really important for us to ask them how they're responding to the content, but then also the instructional methods. Um, and then to seek their input in along the way through various means to make sure that the process of learning is reciprocal and it's a two-way street. It's something that is more like a conversation rather than something that is a flow from teacher to student only in one direction. And something else that I think is really important is that when we think about teacher pedagogical practices being transformed to keep up with the times and to ensure relevancy, we're not only thinking about how we want our practices to be relevant and applicable to our students, but we're also thinking about how they learn. So we're not just winding up teaching students in the ways that we learned or continue to learn, but we are responding to and seeking input regarding the ways that they are demonstrating curiosity about the world and trying to find the answers to the questions that they have. They are engaged and they are interested. They require, however, that they discover relevance, a relevance that speaks to and illustrates their here and now. 
As Adichie said earlier this week, the relevance may actually look like our students, or it may have moments, events, relationships, challenges, aspirations, for example, that resonate with them and or others whom they do not know personally. What most Generation Z students will decidedly not do is accept one interpretation, one path, one size fits all. Inquiry is their watchword. Why is their shield? In so many wonderful ways, this generation of students is allowing us, encouraging us, to assume the mantle of learning and discovering with them. They are rejecting a singularity of meaning in lieu of a protean relevant meaning. Once awakened, these students are willing to go there with regard to the deep dive and close read. Citing Kenneth Burke, those students do become consubstantial with the text, with the characters, the incidents once they and we have unlocked a text through explore, exploration and manipulation. Reading becomes wonderfully messy again, an experience where we and our students embark on a journey of adventure, fear, challenge, surprise, conflict, duty, honor, hubris, deceit, treachery, Magic, the fantastic, the unexpected, the unimaginable, the unspeakable, heroism, villainy, and the rest of humanity with the characteristic traits. We wrestle with the words and the arrangement. We unlock texts with our students by empowering them, trusting them, expecting from them their best, the best from all of our students. Some may be slower, some may be faster, others may be more deliberate readers. Our guidance and our patience and expectations for success empower our students to peer deeply into a text, fiction, nonfiction, searching for the nugget that speaks to them, that reflects their world, that illustrates their experiences, that enables them to transcend the barriers of time and space and unleash their minds and imaginations. In our classrooms, with our resources and tools, this generation can utilize reading, thinking, writing, speaking, and listening and research to relate not only to their present, but also our students can observe and study human reaction and response and the cause and effect life choices and challenges of the past. Next clip is Nathan Morrill from Texas. You can do that. Woo I like to follow their needs academically. I like to follow their needs, uh, you know, emotionally as well. And what that does is, is kind of getting the kids to, uh, to relate to something that has to do with their lives. And I live out here in the farm area, so it's kind of difficult to come up with literature and, and writing and all kinds of good stuff that is fun for young farm ranching kids to enjoy because they constantly ask me, what do I need this for? Why do I need to do this? And that's the question is why, right? So I always like to have an answer for the why, right? And I always refrain, hey, what we're doing is we are, we're, we're building a skill set that uh, apparently you're lacking right now that you will in the future need to incorporate in your future success as a farmer, as a communicator, as a rancher, as a future employer with, uh, employee with anybody out there that you're going to join in the world marketplace. Um, so what I like to have them do is, is practice. And as they practice, they start to realize the importance. And as they realize, they start to learn. And then they starting to apply, uh, to apply what they've learned. And they realize the investment that they've kind of uh, taken in and invested in themselves academically, intellectually, and emotionally as well. What do we get as their teachers when we do all of this and when Nathan does what he does? We get the privilege to embark on this amazing journey and adventure time after time after time. We get to know that we are preparing this generation for the, quote, rough side of the mountain 
as the old Negro spiritual says, as well as another that says, I'm going up, going up, going up all the way, Lord. A writer with whom we are all familiar absolutely loved and depended on his teachers, elementary through high school. He once said, my experiences with Bill and Henrietta Miller and later Evan Whitfield provided me with a formative supplemental education during my elementary and junior high school years. In effect, the Winfield Millers included me in their family, not only sharing cultural activities, but making me a participant in their political discussions. My association with Bill Miller gave intellectual support to my instinctive resistance to the oppression I already knew fit firsthand. Among this writer's favorite books were A Tale of Two Cities, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Macbeth, County Cullen's Poetry, Henry James's Dostoevsky's and Balzac's fiction. The writer's name, James Baldwin. On teachers and education, Baldwin said as an adult, quote, the purpose of education finally is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to make his own decisions, to say to himself that this is black or this is white, to decide for himself whether there is a God in heaven or not, to ask questions of the universe and then learn to live with those questions is the way he achieves his own identity. If America is going to become a nation, she must find a way, and this child must help her to find a way to use the tremendous potential and tremendous energy which this child possesses. Now the last teacher, Winona Sigmund from Virginia. I've been asked to think about relevance and I always connect that to engagement and how we meet the needs of the students we're teaching today. Um, I think my gray hair indicates that I've been around for quite a while. I've completed 40 years of public school teaching and kids have changed but their essential needs I believe are still the same and part of that need is for them to be understood and appreciated and for us as their instructors to try to have a foot in their world. So I think it's really important to talk to students about their interests, their concerns, the political situation, and how they're feeling, and if they're worried, and if they are worried, to what extent. I think it's that two-way communication that we as professionals need to be attuned to what they watch and read and think and listen to, and that they in turn need to be current with what's going on in our world. And I think then you can have conversations about older works of literature. My seniors are currently reading Great Expectations. They're gonna follow Great Expectations with the Scarlet Letter. Now we don't solely read books from the 19th century or the early 20th century. We do read some very contemporary literature, but that the date of publication doesn't change its relevance to students in their lives, provided that we take the time and the energy to provide that link. I conclude with the affirmative declaration, teaching most assuredly has not left us. Our expertise, focus, dedication have not left us. What has transpired is the emergence of a new non-passive generation. They have emerged with their own unique lens and ways and pathways of seeing, understanding, and making meaning. We must join them on this journey to assure all of their tomorrows. Our doing so will necessarily assure that our students achieve equity through lifelong literacy, and their attainment will have been through our ceaseless and focused efforts. Thank you.